So as part of our discussions this month of August of various issues with various South Africans tonight, we're joined by Cheryl Carolis, uh, stalwart, ANC stalwart. This is part of our discussions this August. And uh, she has, of course, various, very titles, struggle veteran, as I mentioned earlier on, and many others, including student leader. She's also been a teacher, general secretary of the UDF, member of uh, UWO, and general secretary of FEDSO, member of the SACP, ANC, and a business person. I almost ran out of breath saying <laughs> that. A very good evening to you and welcome. And of course, it, it, it is special talking to you about this a day before Women's Day, Women's Month in South Africa. But tomorrow, looking back at that particular day, you were born several years later. How did that shape you? How did that influence who you became and the career path perhaps you followed? To be like you, good evening, and good evening to all the viewers. I also, uh, it's very special sitting and talking with you, an accomplished young woman whom I've watched grow and flourish over the years, the day before Women's Day, because Women's Day will always be special for me. And I get quite irritated when people try to reduce it to women doing their nails and the spa and, you know, whatever, because... It comes from a place that I take great pride in, mm. and it comes from a place that the, many of the participants were, in fact, the people where I had the enormous privilege of learning at their feet, and they shaped me, they held me, they pushed me, they slapped me over the knuckles when they needed to. And so I... What were some of those generational lessons that you shared with them and that you continue to share. I mean, that march, as you say, had great meaning to it. It was about obliterating subjugation of the black person in South Africa. But more than that, freedom, mm. uh, whether it's financially or just even spatially. Mm. No, in fact, you know, Tepi, I, I had the enormous privilege of, as I say, being that generation in between. So many of the participants and those who couldn't participate but who were very much part of shaping that march, like Masi Sulu, who was banned and, you know, at the time. But we've had people like Aunt Helen Joseph, Mam Dora Tamana, Liz Abrams, just the most phenomenal women who were leaders in the women's organization when I became part of the women's movement and I was just a little girl. And their resilience, their humanity, their wisdom, their, there was just so much about them that really, really um, shaped me at the stage when I was just a kid. So when you look at that cause and to think that in South Africa, obviously International Women's Month is in, is in March, but we celebrate it here mm. in South Africa on the 9th because of that historic moment. Mm. If you look at the fact that we started observing, commemorating the day from 1995 to what it is today. You lamented the fact that sometimes there's a bit of cosmetic element to looking at the issues. But the issues that we put to the fore, mm. are we having meaningful conversations about them? Are we being real about what is it that women contend with in this day and age? You know, Tippi, maybe uh, the march, march for me demonstrated how so often women who weren't affected and affected in quite the same way about the politics of power. Uh, it, it was such a significant thing. I thought about it over the weekend when I went to go and spend some time with mm -hmm. ANC MPLs in Pumalanga and, in fact, uh, in Limpopo. And what occurred to me about that march was in fact many of the challenge or the, the issues and the challenges that we should be dealing with as a nation. We had the extension of the pass laws to women after it was put to men and the devastating effect was quite obvious to the women who were often banished to rural areas and the men sent as, as cattle to come and work uh, according to the needs of the economy which mainly benefited a handful of whites. And the women understood the devastation, and we can still see today the impact, the dreadful impact of what the past laws meant, that spatial inequality, the sort of overlay between poverty and race and gender, 
and urban and rural, because that's all that came with the migrant law system that came with the parcel laws. And the women decided to resist it. And, you know, uh, the ANC, the men in the ANC, when the women said they wanted to organize this march to launch the protest, they actually said, no, the women couldn't do it. Why? Because like every decent sexist man, they thought that women were incapable of pulling off something like that and that the women were effectively going to bring the ANC into disrepute uh, because they would pull off this, this thing would not work. And, you know, the women took on the power of our organization. Uh, the leadership was, of course, male. And women spoke truth to power and said this is going to be so devastating. And in many ways in South Africa today, we also faced with a situation where uh, on the ground members of political parties, and in particular my party, the ANC, mm -hmm. are having to, had to go through a period where we had to decide, are we going to actually just take this public and take on the leadership about a, ro a route that we thought was disastrous for the country? And so the women actually went and organized it, despite the men. And many of the men, for example, said to the women, well, if you do that, you take the children with you. Well, the women did. And the amazing thing was, at the end of it all, the women actually, after having taken on the leadership of the organization, they won. They won, firstly, because they pulled off a highly successful march, a highly disciplined march, and proved the ANC wrong. But... Uh, oh, well, they also achieved success because Stradom ran away and then a month later Stradom died. So they proved the point. What Tinta Bafazi, what Tinta Bukor. Just listening to you, it, it's, it's interesting to bring it to present day because you spoke about proximity to power, contestation mm -hmm. of power. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at it in the now because I'm saying to you, fast forward several decades later, you have the ANC Women's League calling you a patriarchal princess. <laughs> How are you processing that in your mind? Where is it taking you in, you know, in time and place of You, you, know, what, you know what's it, I mean, I, I don't even think it's worthy of response. I think those sort of somewhat deranged utterances, somewhere but like the recent utterances of the Secretary General of the ANC coming at the similar kind of deranged midnight hour virtually, it's just not even worth the response. Are they not, though, Ms. Carolus? Because then we're talking about what you mentioned earlier on, the unity of women to come together. There was a time when people were asking why the Women's League is not doing enough to fight for a woman president, female president. And now we're talking about the kind of ethical leadership that ought to be at the helm, which is how this came about, the debate on who should be on the list of the IC going into the elections, were people left behind in the evolution of the movement, the ANC as a party, were people left behind in the evolution of the women's movement, including when you joined the UWO, part of those people were also part of the ANC Women's League? No, I would say that uh, it's quite disappointing and shocking, I think, how many of the people who made the kind of laughable noises, I mean, <laughs> I, I really don't think it warrants a response, that mm. kind of deranged deluge uh, about myself and Barbara Hogan. I think our track record speak for itself. But having said that, I think it is shocking that uh, the Women's League, the ANC Women's League, had consistently stood by a very bad president, namely Jacob Zuma, including some shocking stances they adopted during the whole rape trial, the way in which many of the women in the ANC Women's League were at the forefront of hounding that young woman to the point where she died. And I think it's shameful. Mm -hmm. I also think, for example, that night of the, where there was that very dignified, silent protest by a group of young women at some election results. Um, and, you know, the right to protest is one that we fought for hard and long. And that includes when, we, when people protest in a way or about topics that we don't necessarily agree with. It's a right that we should always be defending, and particularly women. And the fact that those four young women, I can't remember they were allegedly EFF people. I don't care, quite frankly, where they're from. I think they have the right to demonstrate. And the people who physically assaulted them were actually leading women from the Women's League. And I mean, like, using violence to remove 
a group of dignified young women who could be our children. Is it reaching to suggest that perhaps it's uh, the, the, the violence born on the psyche of women through the struggle that has perhaps brought uh, women within your party, the ANC Women's League, within the women's movement that see them protesting in, in the manner, the new forms of protest that we've seen where women strip bare naked to say, you're not listening to us. Is that indicative of the psyche wrought on women to this point that we've seen new forms of protest, but also the violent disagreement in women's movement over some issues? No, you know, Tepi, the, unfortunately, throughout history, women in positions of authority or power, many of them are nothing but men dressed in, in dresses, in women's clothing. So, but I must say that I don't think... Why that, is that, though? Yeah, you, you're right that it is a, a bit of a psyche, and in the same way that you will find through the years of struggle against racism, there were blacks who, in fact, assumed the identity, the values, and the persona of their white masters. I would argue it's a minority of people, and they get far too much traction. Whereas, in fact, my experience of women in my own home, in the struggle, in fact, has been a hugely supportive one that has built very strong anti-sexist and anti-violent culture. And I think it's something that we've taken into our constitution. It's much more embedded in South African um, places of decision-making and authority. There's a very thin veneer, and I think we still have a lot of work to do mm. to embed it. I'm going to bring you to what's currently playing out in the political landscape at the moment as a member of um, the ANC uh, stalwart grouping who has been very vocal, the Veterans League who've been very vocal about some of the things that have been going on, the allegations against President Cyril Ramaphosa at the moment. The fact that it's either juxtaposed against the, the fight that the public protector Advocate Busisu M. Kwebani faces as a woman, or even linking the two of them. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, is something somewhere being manufactured, and to what end? Tsepi, I would reject the notion that the uh, views around the public protector or the judgments are tainted by a, through a gender lens. I think our courts are pretty robust, and I know there's noise going on around the place, but I think that it is very concerning for me mm. that an office like that has serially been found wanting in terms of the law, in terms of due process and the rule of law. I do not see any evidence of uh, somebody holding that office being treated in a way that is tainted uh, by a uh, bigoted uh, gender uh, perspective. And I think it is something of deep concern to me that that office is found to be wanting persistently. And I have a very good detector for a sexist mm. uh, tone. I don't find it. There. I think it's... Why does it seem, though, that some people find it easy to play off the two against each other? I'm talking about the, the current public protector and her predecessor, uh, the two women who are of two different characters and perhaps maybe two different legal interpretations of the law, because they're those who play them off against each other to say one is better than the other, and uh, as you say, completely devoid in some cases of the legal arguments that has led to the decisions or findings of their work. Does that not injure the women's movement? Does no, that not I, I actually, I think it's like President Thabo Mbeki mm. had to follow in rather large, significant footsteps. And I think it was good that the bar was high. So anybody who came after Nelson Mandela had a really hard job, and I think 
uh, former President Thabo Mbeki, sometimes... We'll so basically, the, you, your view is that's yes, what is going I on in that, this case? Uh, our previous uh, uh, public protector uh, advocate, Madan Sela, was really outstanding in the way she acquitted herself of a job. And I think the incumbent has to accept and in fact see it as a strong foundation to build on rather than to compete with. So you spoke about leadership earlier on and you said we were unfortunate to have the leader that we had in President Jacob Zuma. What is your point of view of the narrative now surrounding current President Cyril Ramaphosa about the issue of donations? And of course, that's something that's been a policy discussion about transparency around that. But just around ethical leadership, are there smokes and mirrors in our lenses now in, in South Africa, having been through what we've been through and deciding what is ethical and what is not? Are we being easily um, teased away from actual facts of what is actually going on in this country? Tepi, I must say that I do think the question of party funding is a matter that I have very strong personal views on. And uh, it is that I worry about people who give money to politicians with the hope of um, procuring sort of uh, favours in return later down the line. And which is why I'm with uh, our Chief Justice Mohueng. I really do think that we as South Africans should really find a way in which we fund it because then we can limit mm -hmm. the kind of money that gets spent on it. And so I, just as a matter of principle, I think that is the case. But I do think that there are smoke and mirrors around the debate around President Ramaphosa, firstly because he's the only person being singled out here, that as we say, the, the matters that he's being judged for, and I don't think fairly or unfairly, the only unfairness for me is when it's only focused on him, because then we mustn't forget Musi Maimani, who in fact brought the first charge of, of uh, demanding the president must account, in fact himself had an oopsie moment after his election campaign when he said, oops, Actually, I got 400 million rand, you know, and the DA got money from uh, the Guptas. Uh, and all of that was accepted. And for me, it's part of why I do think we need to look seriously at how people raise money and get transparency around it. But to single out Cyril Ramaphosa, I believe that Ace Mahashule, Jacob Zuma, and indeed the EFF with the VBS thing, is deflecting attention from their own matters, which are now being aired in places such as the Zondo Commission, and in fact trying to deflect the whole debate. Mm. If we must have the, the conversation about party funding, I am personally, as I said, very much in favour. Okay. I asked you about ethical leadership because I want to take us back into the boardroom when you said uh, at some point that we need to put an end to this boys' club. Uh, the, the, the dividends of having female mm. leadership in those boardrooms in, at management level, why are we lagging behind? And, and what are the perceptions? You spoke earlier on about the, the Women's March and what was thought about women's leading this march. So we're s several decades later, still established capital. The boardrooms there are looking rather pale and certainly very little female representativity. You know, Tepi, the, the, the August the 9th is always such a tale of two cities for me because on the one hand, it's, it's a moment where I think sometimes a bit tug-in-cheek. We give all the guys we love a hard time and we give the rogues an even harder time as we should. But there is a joyousness about it for me because if I just think of where we've come in South Africa, so even with those boardroom statistics, I think South Africa is actually street years ahead of most established democracies, and it's because we pay attention and there's a conscious focus on it. But I also do get hopping mad when I actually think 25 years later, and this is still where we are. And then the other thing which also gets me hot under the collar is that a lot of our focus is on government as it should be, but I can assure you government both at a executive level, at the parliament level, at the civil service level, the gender representation is way ahead of mm. the private sector. The private sector should really hang their heads in shape. Just as a final question, and, and I hear what you're saying, we're way ahead, but we could do better. No, no, we've got lots to do. We are not anywhere near where we ought to be. Generally, looking forward at South Africa, what we should hope for and what is reasonable to expect just over 
say, the next five years, especially with regards to the political landscape? To be so, I think we have really great um, examples of the benefits of diversity. And for me, the most outstanding one is perhaps our constitution and the making of that. And how we demanded and we won the right to have 50% of the people at that table who made decisions about what goes into the constitution, how it's worded, were women. And to get there, we stood together as people across political parties. We put the country first. And that's another matter, incidentally, that I think coming up now. You know, do you, when you go to parliament or if you are an elected representative, whose interest do you represent? And I say as an ANC member to ANC comrades who we send there, you place the country first. And there are times where I expect you to join hands with all political parties to build a consensus about what's best for the country. And but to go back to the constitution making process, I think today there is universal agreement that the fact that there were 50 percent, that half the room who wrote our constitution were women has contributed enormously to the quality and the outcomes of that constitution and the level of consensus in getting there because women deal with conflicts differently and sometimes it's a disadvantage. Sometimes I feel maybe we should just punch somebody or kick them on the shins a bit more. But uh, on the whole, we actually deal very differently with conflict compared to men. And so we got a constitution that was universally acclaimed as something we should live by and hold up as a lodestar. Uh, and the fact that half the people in the room thought differently about what our priorities should be. And I think it proved the point about diversity because what the ANC certainly did during that time was to make sure there were people with disabilities in the room. And you know, the place where the negotiations were taking place, they had no facilities for people with this in wheelchairs. Mm. And it was just a huge learning curve about what diversity actually brings. And I think, uh, sadly, we're going to have to leave it on that <laughs> note. Thank you so much for speaking to us, ANC Struggle. Uh, veteran and uh, businesswoman Cheryl Carolus and uh, we're going to take a quick break, don't go away.